freedom Everybody, thank you so much for your patience. Really sorry about that. My computer decided it didn't like me anymore, and so I had to restart it. It was just freaking out. Um, all right, well, welcome to the final week of this installment of uh, Stuck in the House with myself, Lewis Beck, also known as Sylvan Paul, also known as just Justin Beck, which is my given name. I know, very, very confusing. I apologize. Uh, anyway, for those of you who are returning, welcome back. For those of you who are tuning in just for the first time, welcome. Um, so, you know, as many of you know, 343 Labs is a music production school in New York City, and we also offer tons of courses online, and especially with what's been going on in the world recently, um, we've been entirely online. Uh, fingers crossed we're going to be able to start being able to do in-person classes again soon, but, um, you know, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, uh, we offer classes in Logic, Ableton, mixing, mastering, uh, songwriting, and a newly formed class that uh, I had helped develop called Vocal Production. So, today we are going to be, and also, if you don't know, we actually have giveaways every week, if you tune in. So that means that uh, even if you hate what I'm saying, you maybe should stick around so that you can get some free stuff. Anyway, so today the giveaway is the uh, Arturia OBXA plugin, which is a really cool synth plugin. Um, the Arturia stuff is very, very powerful, and um, there are a lot of producers who swear by it. So, you know, it's a really cool thing if you, if you happen to be the person to win. And uh, as always, if you dig the content that we're giving you and you've been tuning into a bunch of these, uh, please subscribe to our channel so you can see all the content that we have. There are tons of tutorial videos from all of our instructors, including, of course, myself. There's a more uh, abbreviated version of a house music tutorial. And, um, of course, what we're doing today and what we have been doing for the past three weeks is working on producing, arranging a house music track. All right. So for those of you that may not know, uh, we've been, I've been rather working on this track for the past three weeks. And so the first week, what we did was we just talked about some of the basic principles of house music production and composition. Um, we looked at, you know, just the idea of making sure that, you know, you're functioning within the, um, the, you know, eight bar, 16 bar structure. Uh, we looked at how to apply groove, how to apply swing. Uh, how to you know make your baseline work with your groove, how to create synchronicity in the entire project, things like that. Of course, then what we did was we arranged it out and started talking about some production tricks. And now um, today what we're going to be doing is, is we're going to be doing a kind of like crash course, you know, mixing thing with it. Um, I'll still show you some production tricks because at the end of the day, when you're working on your own music, the... Um, the line between production and mixing is hazy at best. Um, now, I should also tell you that uh, I currently cannot physically respond to anything coming into the chat. So if you want me to address something, please just drop it in there, and I'm going to do my best to uh, address it verbally. And if I don't address it within like five minutes of you dropping it in, just drop it in again. And. Um, Let's just go ahead and get started. Last thing I'll say is because we, uh, or 
I was having technical difficulties with this. What we're actually going to do is uh, we're going to go until 2.15. We normally would go until 2, but we're going to go a little bit later. So I want to give you guys that extra time. All right. So first of all, I just want to talk about like what is mixing. Uh, a lot of people kind of freak out about it and think that like maybe the reason that their music isn't being signed or the reason that they're not famous is that they're, they're mixing and their mastering isn't good enough. And I'm here today to tell you that that is complete bullshit and complete nonsense. Um, at the end of the day, a great musical idea is a great musical idea, right? Yes, it needs to be presented in such a way that makes it feel professional and polished. But bottom line is, if you're shopping around demos and your music is incredible, but your mixes are not that good, you will still get signed. So don't think that mixing is some like magical cure-all uh, or, or mastering. It's not, right? It's really about creating a cohesive um, project, musical idea, right? Where the production decisions that you're making are logical and complement one another. And basically what mixing is, is trying to fix any time where that is not happening, right? Or it's to try to ensure that that happens in a more effective way. So when it comes to mixing uh, house music or just electronic music in general, or actually I should say dance floor oriented electronic music, right? Um, the most important place to start is the low end. Right? In fact, I would even argue that if you get your low end completely right, the rest of the mix almost doesn't matter in dance music because that's what people are there for in the club. Right? They're there for like that pounding, tight, powerful low end. And um, anything else, I think, is just a plus. Now, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try to make the rest of your mix good, but that's just to say that you should definitely give the most amount of attention and detail to making sure that your low end, meaning your kick and your bass and anything else that inhabits those lower frequencies, is working well. So, um, there are tons of artists that never get to the point of mixing their own music. So, I'm just kind of, I'm seeing what you're saying in the chat here, Chroma Beats. And, like, if you are a musician, but, you know, you don't mix and master your own stuff, that has absolutely no bearing on your level. There are plenty of amazing artists that don't mix their own music. It's a difficult skill. And the thing is, is that it's a completely separate skill from producing. Right? It really relies, relies more on your ears than anything. Uh, and so until you start understanding what music is supposed to sound like, which I realize might sound like a weird thing. It's like, well, I've been listening to music all my life. Of course I know what music is supposed to sound like. Well, what it really is is it's more about the balance between frequencies and how you know, wide the project is, the stereo width, and um, also just the balance of the instruments in terms of volume. So... So I'm not entirely sure what you mean, uh, TWD Industries. Uh, mixing and mastering, I do mixing and mastering work for labels and other artists. So yes, uh, it's extremely important. But what I'm saying to you is that y if you think your music isn't being signed or isn't getting attention because it's poorly mixed, that's not the reason. So... Obviously, if it doesn't feel professional, that will be a little bit of an issue. But if the music itself isn't compelling, it doesn't matter how good the mixer master is. So that's the point that I'm trying to make to you is if you don't, if you think that um, that mixing and mastering is what is holding you back. I hate to break it to you. It's not. It's your music and you need to work more on production and producing. And the bottom line is, is that a really if you're producing your own work, right? then it should already be a really good mix if you're a good producer. Because what that means is, what a mix is, okay, is it's literally just taking the elements that are there and making sure that they function together in a logical, cohesive way. If you're a really good producer, that means you're already doing that from the get-go. So that means selecting good samples if you're doing that. That means designing good sounds if you're doing that, right? That means also actually arranging your project in such a way that it's not too busy at any given moment in time and that whatever, whatever is happening allows the listener to be able to focus on the thing that's most important at that particular part. So, you know, the three most important things in mixing are going to be volume, EQing, 
and then uh, we'll, we'll say tonal balance, really. Volume, tonal balance, and uh, spatial dynamics. So if you can get those three things um, really down, then you'll have great mixes. So the idea that like EQing and compression is mixing is incorrect. They are important aspects of mixing, but in an ideal world, you actually really shouldn't even have to EQ or compress. You chose your sound so perfectly, you produced your project so well that you designed each sound in such a way that it complements every single other one that it's just perfect. Now that usually doesn't happen. You're usually gonna have to do some mixing. Sometimes you have to do a lot of mixing, right? But the bottom line is, is that if you produce the song well, you're already halfway there. So what I'm gonna show you guys is some tricks for how to take your trap, your house tracks specifically and make them more powerful, right? And more dynamic and more alive. Anyway, let's get going. So let's take a listen to this track. Got you, TW Industries. Sorry, maybe you feel like I had to go on the defensive. Generations music would be a synthesis of those two elements. And some third thing, it might rely uh, heavily on uh, uh, electronics, you know, tapes, using machines. All right, so the first thing that I want to talk about that's going on in this track is that it seemed like the bass kick was powerful enough at the start of the track, and then the bass line came in, right? Which is overpowering it a little bit. So, a lot of people think, right, that it's mandatory to uh, what you would call sidechain your bass line off of your kick drum, right? And so for those of you that aren't familiar with sidechaining, what sidechaining simply is, is it's a way of using a compressor where the input source that triggers the compression is a different instrument as opposed to the instrument that's on the channel. So it causes it to duck out of the way of whatever triggers it. The new uh, generation's music would be um, a synthesis of those two. So what we're going to do is I'm first actually, before I do anything like side chain or anything like that, I'm actually going to see if I can get it to be punchy and coming through without using side chaining. And I'll explain why. Okay, so side chaining, as useful as it is, uh, if it's overdone, and usually it's incorrectly done as well, so that in and of itself is a huge problem. Um, if it's overdone, what you're actually doing is, is you're completely throwing off the natural dynamics of the track. Now, a lot of the times in dance music, right, we specifically want to create the pumping sensation, and we will explore side chaining in a moment, but I honestly am a big proponent in that if you're using side chain, to fix something, that's not the best thing to do. It's awesome to use it as a functional tool, meaning to create something to pump, but if you're using it to fix a problem, you're just kind of disguising the problem and not really addressing it. So the number one way to make your kick drum more powerful is to apply what we call parallel compression. And so I'd like to, when I'm working on a full drum rack, I like to do it in this view just so I can really get a bigger breakdown of like what's going on in here. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to drag on, yeah, I'm actually going to use some external plugins for this because I want to show you guys the power of some of this stuff. So I'll drag on this plugin called the plus 10 dB compressor. This is based off a uh, famous compressor called the uh, 760 Compex. Um, yeah, it's, I forget the name of the company specifically that makes it, but basically what it is is a compressor and expander all in one thing. Um, 
I don't know what you mean, Lightning Tree, by using a volume utility to sidechain. You definitely should use a compressor to physically sidechain. Um, yeah, and Chroma Beats, you 100% can get someone else to mix and master your songs. You just have to pay them because people who do that, myself included, make a living doing it. Um, all right. So, all right. So the way that parallel compression works is you basically want to over compress the signal, like really aggressively. Now, depending on your signal source, you're either going to want to allow the transient true or through or kill it. So the transient, right, is the start of the sound. It's actually this like first peak that we have here. So. I'm going to keep the attack slow. I only have actually three options here, right? So there's 0.25 milliseconds, which is a crazy fast attack, okay? Then we have 2.5 milliseconds, and then we have 25 milliseconds, which is also fairly fast. It's leaning more towards medium, right? But um, it's still a little bit faster than I would do if I was to throw this directly on the channel. Like, I wouldn't use this for a kick drum directly on the channel. Uh, especially with like a 909 kick, there's a lot of body that comes through there. And you can actually read on this view the number of milliseconds that are occurring across the length of this sample. So if you look right here, it says 100, right? So look how much of the kick happens b before 100 milliseconds. That's actually like a lot. So I would say probably if you were going to compress this directly on the channel, you know, to just try to tighten it up, you would probably want to do like 50 milliseconds, maybe 40, 45, or something like that. And believe it or not, those five milliseconds can make a huge difference. But when you're working in parallel, it's actually not an issue because all I'm trying to do is allow the punchiness of it through this first big hit. And what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to slam this, all right? Now, you may be thinking, what do you mean parallel compression, dude? You put this directly on the channel. Well, one of the cool things about Ableton is that you don't necessarily need to use sends and returns to create parallel processing. So if I hit Command G on anything that I drag on, I can create an audio effects rack, right? I open up the chain, I create a new chain, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna label these. Labeling is very important. I probably have already been preaching that, but if you don't remember that, I'm gonna say it again. Labeling is so important, okay? You need to be able to quickly find what is happening and where it is happening, all right? It's nothing to do with being OCD and being, oh, I have to be organized. No, it's because if you're on a deadline, right, you will waste 20 to 30 to 45 minutes potentially being like, oh, where did I put the kick drum? Not literally taking 40 minutes to find the kick drum, but, you know, it compounds over the course of the project of not being able to remember what is what and where is what, right? I'm a big proponent of organization. I tell that to my students all the time. So I'm going to call this dry signal, and I'm just going to call this wet. Right? I know what the wet is. It's just the compression. So first I'm going to solo the wet signal. Well, actually solo this sound, and then solo the kick, <laughs> and solo the wet signal. All right, cool. So with parallel compression, we're looking for a super aggressive compression, right? And... Um, Yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure what you're talking about, Lightning Tree. Maybe if you, if you give it a little more context, I might be able to um, figure it out. Uh, all right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to crank my ratio to 20. So I'm, I believe in doing really aggressive parallel compression. Like the whole point is that you're blending in something to the sound. It's not the actual sound itself. It's not like your main source, right? So... Um, I like to do at least 10 decibels. I, I, I prefer to go higher. I want to slam this shit, right? So what I'm also going to do is I'm going to have to figure out what I want my release time to be, right? And again, I can actually use uh, a little bit of like math to figure this out, what might be a decent release time based on what I want to accomplish. So if you type in the number uh, six, 60,000 and divide your BPM, divide 60,000 by your BPM, which in this case is 120. Now, I just happen to know off the top of my head, not because I'm a math genius, because I've done this a million times though, that uh, 60,000 divided by 120 is 500. 
So the reason you do that is because this actually gives you your, um, what would you call it? Your BPM, your, your quarter note value in milliseconds, right? Because your BPM is measured in quarter notes, 120 quarter notes per minute. So if you divide a minute, right, in using milliseconds, 60,000 milliseconds in a minute, if you divide that by 120, which is the number of quarter notes in your, in a, in your um, minute, right, um, then you get your quarter note value in milliseconds, which is going to be 500, right? So in theory, what I could do is I could say, all right, well, my attack is 25 milliseconds, so I'm going to subtract that from 500, and what I would get would be 475 milliseconds would be the in ideal or perfect release time, meaning that it's going to push it down and pop right back up and actually exaggerate the pumping effect, the attack of the kick. So what I'll do is I'll set this to 0.4, which is 400, which honestly is close enough. Like that level of fine tooth comb is not going to actually make a difference on the, um, the parallel set necessarily. Now, something to keep in mind is there's a very simple way that I think about applying parallel compression. Okay. So Basically, if you want to increase, um, what I would say is like transient energy, if you want to exaggerate or, or bring energy out in a uh, production, you should use a fast release. The reason for that is it makes the dynamics wobble, right? So literally what a compressor is doing is it's taking anything that is crossing a threshold, right? Or we call a peak that is crossing a threshold and pushing it down. It's reducing it to level it out, right? So the whole concept behind compression is simply to make things that are too loud quieter so that the whole signal is level and easier to broadcast, easier to listen to, all those types of things, easier to fit into a mix, okay? But um, what you can do is, is you can also use a compressor to actually exaggerate dynamics and make them worse. So if you misuse a compressor, you actually can increase a problem. But if you know how to use it in a cool way, what you can do is you can inject um, life into something. So I don't need to do that on a kick drum. There's, there's enough life on the kick drum. Um, but with, when, it's really fast, when it's a really fast release, what it literally does is it causes the compression to go like this, right? To compress, release, compress, release, compress, release, really fast. And so it makes it seem like it's breathing and more alive. Anyway, that's a very long winded explanation. Let's just keep moving. So I want to get at least 10 decibels of gain reduction when I'm doing parallel compression. And I have my release set, I have my attack set, I have my ratio set, and now I'm just gonna drag the threshold down until I get a lot of compression. And it looks like I don't even need to. That's beautiful. I'm getting tons of compression. Perfect. All right. So what I could do is I could take my release, right, and set it like that so the transient comes through. So what I'm hearing when I do this is that the kind of the grit of the transient is being reduced because the release time is too long, right? So it's literally not recovering close enough to zero for the transient to come through. So it's compressing so much constantly, which I actually don't want. So that's what I want. That works. Perfect. So what I did is, is I took out the low end of the sound and I'm literally just giving the body and the transient. Um, <laughs> I'm glad to hear that, Nefertiti. Uh, okay, Tristan, this is a great question. Uh, does the dry wet mix knob on any VST in effect create parallel processing? So short answer, yes. Long answer, no. So the reason I say no is because the idea of parallel processing, okay, is that you're taking a signal and not adjusting it at all. And then taking a wet signal and blending it back in, okay? So the thing is, is that when you reduce the dry wet knob, right, from dry towards wet, what ends up happening is you're losing more of the dry signal. Right? Every percentage that you move towards wet, you're losing the dry signal. Now, you could argue, oh, well, you can just get this back in makeup gain. Right? But the fact of the matter is you're actually going to change the profile of the sound slightly if you do that. Um, so if you don't mind having what you might say is like a non-transparent parallel and you just use the makeup gain, okay, you could do that. I don't think 
anyone's going to necessarily say that like that is incorrect. I simply believe that uh, you can get a more effective parallel, like true to form parallel processing if you d create the actual send return or in this case audio effect rack setup. So that was a really great question, man. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do now is the most important part is I'm going to unsolo this and I'm going to take this drive, this wet part and drag it all the way to zero. And what I'll do is, is I will blend it back in in the context of the track until it feels like the bass, the kick reinforces and starts cutting to the bass. So let's Jeez. So what you're looking for with parallel compression is you don't necessarily want the sound to get louder, but you want it to sound like the um, you want it to sound like when you turn it off, like something's missing in the mix. So what we can hear is that the kick drum moves forward in the mix significantly with the parallel compression on. And it feels like it just gets really weak with it off. But now right there at the front of the mix coming through so one thing I can also do to make the kick drum cut through is to actually weirdly increase some high frequencies now this is one of the most counterintuitive things about mixing low end is that you actually can use manipulate high frequency content to affect the way that we perceive low end so I'm gonna use this EQ right here after this compressor. It's the same company. I like the way this EQ sounds. It's also low CPU. I'm not trying to explode my computer right now since we're streaming. <laughs> so what I'll do is, is I'm actually just going to set a uh, notch, the band, to 8,000 roughly. I, the only thing I don't like about this compressor is you can't get exact, but that's okay. Um, I set this to 8,000. And I'm just going to increase a little bit of 8,000. So 8,000 is basically a uh, presence frequency. Um, don't overuse it because if everything's in your face, nothing's in your face. But um, it's really good for elements that you need to just get a little bit of extra clarity in the mix. off so if we solo in here you hear we just get that little bit of snap on top of the kick a little bit more of that snap and what's crazy is because there's barely anything there anyway. If we go open up Spectrum for a second. And we put it before the EQ. What you can see is, is that there's like no, there's barely any high frequency content on this kick drum compared to how much low frequency content there is, right? So if I boost at 8,000, I literally, <laughs> and let's, let's look at this for a second. The, it, it's uh, like, 36 decibels quieter than what's going on up here. So me boosting 17 decibels is not even remotely crazy. All that it's actually doing is just bringing out a little bit of that snap, so. There we go. Really the definition on the transient. So now that kick drum is really tightened in there. So just to review, literally the only thing I did was I did some parallel compression and I did a little bit of EQing where I boosted the high end, right? That's all I needed to do. Now, what I also could do is I could come down to 60 hertz and just give it a little notch.
That just makes it a little bit juicier. And it makes the uh, the kind of boxiness of the kick, which is very common in a 909, unfortunately, as much as I love them, especially if it's a sample and not directly from a real 909. Um, what it does is it actually relaxes that boxiness by adjusting the tonal balance a little bit. And it makes it sit a little bit more, like we're sitting on top of it, which is a warmer sound, which I prefer. Uh, okay, so again, just 60 hertz, 8K, you do a little bit of boost at both those places, you're probably good to go on your kick. Uh, well, actually, a lot of boosts at 8K, depending on your sample. If you have a really sharp digital sample, I don't recommend doing that. It's going to sound really awful. Um, okay, so the next thing I might do is I actually would now come to my bass and I say, okay, you know what? The bass isn't, the bass isn't jacking enough off of the kick. So what I would do is, is I would take my compressor, right? Just use the Ableton compressor for this. You don't need to get all fancy. And I'll put this, this is important, before the gain utility, okay? So if you remember, I used the gain utility to adjust volume, right? And the reason for that is so I can still access this volume knob most easily if I want to adjust level, right? So this is a little pro tip. I highly recommend you do this. Now, anyway, what I want to do is I want to set up my sidechain input for my compressor. Now, the problem is, said, oh, my drums are in one track. Now, because I was demonstrating uh, how to create a drum loop for this project, what I did was, right, is that I, um, what should I call? I did it all in one track, all the drums. So I normally do not recommend doing that. I actually hate doing that, and I think it causes more problems than it solves, specifically because it makes it more difficult to uh, get a really more like intricate and, and effective, you know, detailing of compression of uh, side chaining and imaging and all sorts of texturization things that you just can, if, if you have each track on an individual thing, you can get a little bit more effective with. Um, so what I can do though, is I can use a little bit of witchcraft. And so the Ableton compressor, the Ableton compressor has something cool built into it. So I'm gonna side chain it off the drums, right? Can't select the kick. So what that means is that the entire drum kit is going to make the bass line side chain, which I do not want, okay? I just want the kick to make it duck, right? So again, side chaining, all it is, is it's setting up a compressor so that the signal which triggers the compression is from another instrument so that when that instrument plays, this instrument gets pushed down and ducks out of the way. Now, what I can do is I can turn on this EQ function in the compressor in Ableton. What this allows me to do is it actually allows me to choose what frequencies the compressor is going to target. So for instance, if I want to target only the kick drum frequencies in my drum kit, I can actually turn this down to like 150, maybe even, let's try 150 at first. Now the problem is, is that I probably will catch a little bit of my snares in there, but um, maybe a little bit of my clap, but hopefully that won't be the case. And if it is, we'll figure that out in a second. So what this allows me to do, right, is I can pick a, a low pass filter, meaning that it's going to ignore everything above 153 hertz. So I can now make only the low end of my kick target the, make the bass pump. Now the other thing that's cool about that is that I can allow the transient energy of my bass line to actually remain intact, right? And the transient energy is coming from the higher frequencies, the place where we're feeling, um, the place where we're like feeling the impact and the articulation, right? So the, the clickiness and the, the place where it, it, you know, the plucks are coming from. And that's actually a good thing, right? I, I want to have that stuff remain intact. If that stuff's constantly ducking and jumping out of the way, it's actually harder to track the activity of the baseline. Um, so Crovo Beats, as your question, no, a compressor does not change frequencies. What it does is it specifically, it controls volume. So it makes it, if something gets too loud, it pushes it down. However, what you can do is, you can set up a compressor so that it is triggered by a different instrument than the source channel that's on. So I have a very basic uh, setup that I do literally every time for sidechain compression. Ratio of six, attack of 0.5, and then just drag the threshold basically halfway into the signal. So let's do that. So I just 
uh, to increase. Yeah, it's basically a really complicated volume switch that has time constants in it. So what that means is that uh, it is able to dictate how you turn the volume down over periods of time without having to manually do it. That's literally what it is. However, there are side effects which you can use to your advantage. Uh, so I ended up opening up the uh, the side. <laughs> the ironic thing is that this is called a sidechain filter. So there's so much. This whole like technique has completely screwed up the the nomenclature for this particular situation. Um, this is technically called a sidechain uh, EQ sidechain filter. Uh, so anyway, I'll just call this the EQ filter though. So I had to open up the EQ filter a little bit because I thought that the body of the kick was not triggering the bass enough. So we now have a pretty. <laughs> You can actually see into the record a little bit more now with this compression. So what this does is it subtly adds a little bit of life to the bass line, right? A little bit of pop. Yeah, so it's side chaining off the kick, right? Even though it technically says drums, it's the kick that's triggering it. All right, so let's actually focus on the bass for a sec now. Um, now I have there's a very I have a simple rule for using sidechain compression, which is you have to use it at the very end of your chain. If you're using a volume utility, then the utility goes after it. But you want to make sure that you are taking the whole idea of the signal and making it change, right? So if I do this and then start doing you know plugins after it again, I just am undoing what I just did. I'm making it not work as well. So once it's set, it's set. I can adjust this sound as much as I want. It's not going to change the way this is behaving because the whole point is that it's being triggered by something else. So what I will do is I actually want to make this um, bass, I want to bring out what we call the articulation, right? Which is like the rhythmic plucking. By the way, you can hear now when we solo it the artifacts of the side chaining right it's being pushed down now in isolation it sounds terrible but in the context of the mix it sounds great and that's the most important thing to remember is that it doesn't matter what it sounds like in isolation it matter what it sounds like in the mix in fact a lot of things that you do to make something sound good in the mix makes it sound bad on its own it's kind of a weird catch-22 um, or paradox I guess you could say so what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna put a transient shaper on the kick this is from isotope I'm not sorry not the kick the bass line I'm just going to target that area. What I can do is I can turn up the attack. Now I should be doing this in the context of the mix, so I'll undo that. And I'm going to what all that I'm looking to do is bring out some of the kind of pluckety plickety plucky pluck things on top. So All right. Let's let's check that out. sounds pretty good right there um, now again you might be noticing that I'm like going really aggressive with a lot of these settings and so uh, I actually you know I don't know if neutron elements has the transient shaper uh, if you just go on to isotope.com you can you'll, you, you can check um, and see if it's included in the bundle I think this is the most the top three most useful plugins from isotope I use it constantly um, especially because it's multiband so it's really nice um, now again because there's barely anything happening in this frequency range relative to how much content there is down here, I really can drive this super aggressively. So one of the secrets to mixing bass is actually targeting frequency ranges, and it's barely in. Um, it's, I know it's kind of counterintuitive. So now we got the bass sounding nice, but I still want to round it off a little on the bottom. So I might come back to this EQ that I was using before. I'm going to put it before the transient shaper. 
and I'll just set a peak at about 100. So one thing that you can do is to, to understand better what is happening with your EQ is you can aggressively boost to see where you're actually targeting. That's exactly what I want. The new uh, generation's music would be um, a synthesis of those two elements and some third so thing. So this just rounds it off a little bit more. Uh, heavily on uh, uh, electronics, uh, tapes. I can kind of envision maybe a, one person with a, uh, a lot of machines taped. Okay, so there's one problem that you have to be aware of when you use uh, sidechain compression. So, yeah, no, uh, that is very correct. Cap, capel, tapel. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, dynamic EQs are insanely used. Um, yeah. All right, so, <clears throat> or insanely useful, sorry. We will be using it, a... a um, a dynamic EQ momentarily, most likely. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So, one of the problems is that the bass sounds great when the kick is in. I can even turn it down a little. It sounds great when the kick is in, but when the kick comes out, it gets too loud because I use this makeup gain, right? So basically what I'll do is I'm just going to adjust the gain utility for this moment where the bass drops out, where the kick drops out. And so I'll literally just solo the track so I can hear it most clearly. So it seems like that's probably a pretty solid number, 4.7. And so all that I'm looking to do here is not hear a change in volume when it transitions. Yeah, that works for me. So all I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go to every single spot in the track where the kick pulls out. And I'm just going to put it to negative 4.7. The great thing about Ableton is it's actually pretty smart. And it'll remember that value because it's like it sees that I'm doing it over and over again. So this is also one of the benefits of using what you would call a ghost kick. So a ghost kick is literally just a duplicate version of your kick drum that you put on its own track and then you just mute it. And the thing is, is that it will still trigger the side chaining, even if it's muted. And so the benefit of doing this is that you don't have to do what I'm doing right now, which is honestly a pain in the ass. Um, so whatever way that you can make your life easier as a producer, you should do that. Anyway, I just fixed this problem, so now we won't hear the bass getting too loud at certain points. All right, so again, add a transient shaper right here, and then I just did a little teensy-weensy bit of boosting right here on uh, at the kind of woo -woo range, right, for the uh, kick drum. I'm sorry, the bass line. <laughs> bass can come down a little. Why do you do automation with the draw mode enabled? Oh, that's the best question. I'm so glad that you asked that. Okay. So the reason is, is that you can, with draw mode enabled, you can lift sections without having to draw dots. All you do is you just draw in there and it creates this perfect lift. So whenever you wanna just create a tabletop automation, instead of going click, click, and then zooming, zooming in, and being like, oh shit, click, click, okay. But then oh, I was like, oh no, right? That's not perfect. That doesn't actually do what you want it to do. So using draw mode automation, 
using the draw mode with automation, I can just target specific sections really, really easily. So, yeah, there we go. All right. Um, all right, all right, all right. Now, the other thing I might do actually on this baseline is I want to give it a little more color, a little more character, a little more vibe. So I'm going to use a return track. And I have this plugin, which is a really weird one, from this company called Positive Grid. Anybody who has ever taken classes with me before or seen some tutorials may have seen me talk about this and have it come up. Basically what, basically what this is is it models a tube compressor, but it also allows you to create... create um, I'm glad that you found that helpful, Paul Gomez. Uh, what it allows you to do is actually choose the components, like the analog modeled components, so you can get a more kind of custom and interesting sound. Now, the reason I like this plugin is because it's made by a company that models uh, guitar amplifiers, and guitar amplifiers are usually, they use tubes, so they obviously have their tube modeling on lock. So all I'm going to do is, this is what's called parallel saturation. I'm going to send this to this return. Perfect. So what I'm actually going to do with this is I'm just going to blend this in a little bit with the bass just to make make it a little bit crunchier, make it a little bit more colorful. That's it. All right, so now it makes it really pop through the mix. thing that's happening here that's a little bit problematic is that we have some of this 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 little snapping coming through which is a result of the actual side chaining that we did so what I could do is is actually the same configuration that we did um, on the audio effects rack so I'll just drag this onto the channel instead put it before right because I want to make sure that it is, uh, what's call, um, still being side chain. I'll just turn this off. I don't need that anymore. Uh, create the, the parallel setup. And so I'll call this saturation. I'll call this dry. And now I'll just blend it in from here. So it's still the same signal. But now it's not actually creating artifacts on the phenomenon of the side chaining. Rather, just the artifacts are being side chained, which is definitely ideal. All right. So I'm going to turn this all the way down and just blend it back in the context mix again. This is also a trick that will allow it to cut through on a laptop. 
Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. You also could use the uh, plugin Saturn from FabFilter, which is really, really useful for this particular trick. What I love is, is that this grit is really like grouping in with the, uh, the baseline grit as well. I'll start with the kick drum grit. So now what I'll go do is I'm going to focus on getting my kit to just sound really tight. So this little guy, I can get it a little, I can get it to snap a little bit more. Now, I remember someone asked before, what about using the dry wet knob on a compressor? Right? This is exactly where I'm going to do that because I want to shape the sound a little bit. So there's this weird plugin that I have from this company called Corniff Audio. Uh, it's a pretty fun one, but it has a really realistic sounding compression artifact. So I'm going to just do this on a closed hi hat. I'm going to try, I'm going to do it in context first and see if I can get it to do what I want it to do. So I'm going to use a fairly fast attack here. Uh, so what I actually am looking to do is I'm looking to snap down on the transient and actually create more of a transient because there isn't much of a transient. This is just a compressor. So I'll use like, yeah, six. And I want my release time to be fast so I can add more life. And let's try this. So, right? We hear that. That snappiness. The new uh, generation's music will be um, a synthesis of those two elements and some third thing. It might rely uh, heavily on uh, uh, electronics and uh, tapes using machines. do now is is I'll come in here and I'll roll back the dry wet and just literally just blend in the uh, the compressed signal so that I get a little bit of poke to them then I have to do what's called gain staging right so gain staging is where I want to make sure that the compressor doesn't make it louder that's a lot louder Perfect. All that it's doing is adding a little bit of snap. Um, I think it's it's not a matter of is it common, it's a matter of is it effective. So in this particular case, I want the beat to just pop through, right? The hi-hats just felt a little bit dull. Like they just didn't have any any rhythmic activity to them. Right? They're so like fuzzy and blurry right now and they're a little bit more rhythmic with the Change with the compressor on. yeah I definitely recommend putting the compressor on hi-hats and using the wet dry knob the wet yeah wet dry knob I don't know that's not weird to my to my mouth <laughs> Change the dry Yeah, perfect. Yeah, so that sounds cool. All right, great. Moving on. Um, so let's come over here and see how the kit's sounding. Maybe what I'll do now also is I'll open up this chain and I will pan my hi-hats. Oops. <laughs> A little bit to the left. generations music the um 
might rely uh, heavily on uh, uh, electronics, uh, tapes, using machines. Now, some of you are going to laugh at what I'm going to do next because this is such a hilariously old plugin that is from the EDM era. Uh, but this is the sausage fattener, and I actually use this every once, of a, every once in a while. Uh, when it seems right, if I just want to add a little bit of like punch and dynamics without having to do too much work, so I just throw this on the clap just to make the clap a little bit more juicy. I'll try to set up. That sounds really nice. Now, of course, it got way too loud. So, fun fact about this plugin, if you have ever used this plugin or if you use this plugin, it's the only plugin in the world you're not supposed to gain stage. It actually undoes what it does. Part of what it really is supposed to do is overdrive the, out, the, uh, the output. So, you want to, ah, where are my plugins? What you actually want to do is you want to drag on a utility after it and then group the two, and then use the utility as the output gain for the plugin itself. So when I turn it on and off, I shouldn't hear a difference in volume because... So I, I like that. Do you recommend using the same hat chain? Okay, great question. Uh, absolutely not. You shouldn't compress the, the open hi-hats. You want to allow them to run free. Um, so like, I'm not going to touch these. Because then you like, lose the gliding feeling that they give you. Something that I will do though to these hi-hats is I'm going to create a return track and I'm going to call this small room. And I'm going to put a uh, reverb on there. Use it. I like I like using this re this reverb from Slate Digital. Uh, and I'm just gonna go find a small dark room. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm gonna set these hi hats to this room. So it just adds spatial dimension to the track, right? Actually, it makes them wider sounding too. Maybe I'll turn down the decay a little bit. So that synth string comes in very awkwardly loud. So I'll drag on the uh, utility. Now, some of you might be realizing that we supposedly only have five minutes left, but honestly, I don't really have anything else to do today, so I'm down to go for another 15, and I'm really into what we're doing right now. <laughs> so it's your lucky day. All right. sounds so damn fake so I'm taking the strings and sending them to this return track as well so what you hear is this so you can actually use a short release reverb which is what this is right to make your track a little bit wider fun fact uh, I'm gonna turn the pre-delay up too because that's important So the pre-delay, the most simple way to explain it is it just decouples the reverb from the actual um, sound that's triggering it. If, uh, it's just the amount of time until you hear the, the, the reverb after the sound triggers it. So 10, sec 10 milliseconds might not seem like a lot, but that could actually be a problem for drums. But for something that has a sustain on it, like this hi-hat, it's not really that big of an issue. Um, all right. So... I'm just going to real quick go through this track and make it so that these strings don't get too damn loud like they've been doing. It's a new uh, generation's music would be um, a 
synthesis of those two elements and some third thing that might rely uh, heavily on the uh, There's a, just a little bit of like, these are little thin sounding. So all these tr sounds that I made in here, right, are coming from Ableton. The, 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 the tracks, the, I'm sorry, the, the instruments in Ableton. And the bottom line is they can be a little thin and harsh sounding sometimes, even if you design them decently, which I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I did. Um, so that's where Universal Audio really comes in handy. Their plugins just warm things up. This is like, I just, you might as well call this plugin the warmifier. Uh, I, I literally, in all circumstances, unless I'm passing it through my outboard gear, which I'm clearly not going to do right now. I don't have time for that. Um, this is what I use to make things sound warmer. So I'm going to come up to 400 and create a, 4,000 and create a dip. Do a little bit of a wider dip at 10K. That should uh, actually even boost the 100. Take the new uh, generation of sound. Music would be um, a synthesis of those two elements and some third thing. It might rely uh, heavily on. Uh, uh, like now, there's a resonant frequency in here that is part of the sound itself, um, which you don't want to just get rid of because then the sound will sound empty and weird. Uh, but it's is a little problematic and annoying to me, so I'm gonna show you how I'm gonna deal with it. First, I'll point it out to you. Right there. So that thing's driving me crazy. I'll just turn it down until it's. So, so those two elements and some third thing. It might rely uh, heavily on uh, uh, electronics, you know, tapes, using machines. So what I'm going to do now is... I'm going to group all my drums. Baseline with my drums, which is a very classic thing to do. Uh, like that's what rock music, they used to do in rock music and stuff like that. Just makes them gel together when I apply a little bit of group processing, which is what I'm about to do. The new uh, generations music would be um, a synthesis of those two elements. So I'm going to take this plug-in from Universal Audio. It's called Fair, Fair Trial, Fair Child. Yeah, that's the case with resonant frequencies, right? It's like you can't hear it, but then once you hear it, you can't unhear it. Uh, that just takes time, you know? I wouldn't even... That, that, that's just that's going to take you a little while to start getting decent with. So I'm going to put this about halfway up. Seems like two... Eh, maybe like right about there. Uh, so again, sidechain filter, right? So that doesn't mean I'm making something sidechain. It just means that I'm not compressing things below whatever that number is. I, the one thing I hate about Universal Audio is they're like, oh, we're vintage. We don't have exact numbers. It's just like, come on, man, get with the program. Let's put some, let's put some numbers on this thing. <laughs> I'm getting it for the sound, not for the look. Uh, all right. So what I'm looking to do here, I'm going to do just a teeniest bit of compression. plug is pretty magical just by putting it on it makes things sound better uh and then i might take the uh the tape plug-in from slate digital um actually you know what this thing's super fun let's try this there's another great plug-in from slate digital called the virtual mix rack which is taking forever to load for some reason 
Um, okay, cool. And it has this guy on it, which is this virtual channel. Basically what it does is it emulates console saturation, which I love. Uh, and so there's a particular style of saturation that sounds great in house music, which is this one. It's called USA, and what it's referring to is the company API. So what I'm going to do with this, I'm going to roll the input back. So it's just about kissing the limit. I turn on the drive. So what it does is it just kind of lifts. It's, it's, like a, it's almost like you EQ the mids without EQing them because that's just the, the way that the transformer that's built into the... Uh, the outboard gear actually works, and if you've ever worked with API, you know that it has this very forward sound that is very ideal for dance music. So, I got that part of my track sounding fuego now. What I might do is, I hate things that are really bright and shiny, so I might just very ever so briefly This guy, again, the Poltec EQP, the, yeah, the, sorry, the <laughs> Pro Legacy, and uh, and simply attenuate it. Let's try 10K, might need a 12K. Wide band. So this is this is this is sounding pretty good. Last thing I want to do is get these guys. These guys sound a little juicier. So let's see if we can just use this. I don't like that. It actually makes it distort. So I'll just grab this again. At 200, make it chubbier. The new uh, generation's music would be um, a synthesis of those two elements and some. If it's 500, thing. it might rely uh, heavily on uh, a little bit uh, electronics, uh, tapes. I can kind of envision maybe. Uh, Give it again. One that boost. At 8K uh, at presence frequency. Tapes, uh, uh, we tighten up the bottom of that. Singing or speaking and using machines. All right, so even though we have a limiter on, I can hear us crunching into it in a horrible way. So I'm just going to turn everything down. There we go. What I might do here with the Jim Morrison thing, the new uh, generation. There's quite a bit of music will be um, low gook in here. Those two elements and some third thing. It might rely uh, heavily on. Uh, and you can see that happening down there, so I'm just going to cut this out. The new uh, generation's music will be um, a synthesis of those two elements and some third thing. It might rely uh, heavily on. Uh, it's also leaning to the left, which is weird. I don't think I realized that last time because I wasn't working the headphones. So I'm just going to mono this out before I even do anything, actually. New uh, generations music will be um, a synthesis of those two elements and some third thing. It might rely uh, heavily on uh, uh, electronics, uh, tapes. I can kind of envision maybe uh, one person. Too loud again. Uh, singing or speaking and, and using machines. So the last 
last thing. Where is this distorting? Come from here? Might be. Yeah, there's a little bit of distortion there. So I'm going to use a little bit. I'm going to kind of apply that same principle that I did to the, uh, the hi-hats. I'm going to do it with these chords where I'm going to hit them with a little bit of compression to make them snap and then uh, roll it back so it's not fully that. But I will use a... Mm, that should do the trick. I'm going to do a pretty high ratio. Perfect. So this is like parallel compression. Uh, no, you do not have to put them in mono, Chris. The only reason I put them in mono was because the left part of the sound, there was too much low end, which was just like awkward. So I wanted to just mono it out so I wouldn't even have to deal with that. I'm gonna put this compressor compressor before the EQ. So I get a fatter sound. And maybe I'll actually put this out wide now. I just made them in analog. So if you remember, we did this little fun thing last time.
So I'm gonna send the bass line with that acid sound to this uh, to this small room reverb, literally only for this part of the song. So it also feels a little bit different. <laughs> have to do here is I'm actually going to use this is the last thing we're going to do and then we're going to stop and I'm going to announce the winner um, is I'm going to use I just isotope plug in uh, a multiband compressor um, is there a hip hop double kick in the beat uh, no there's just a, a cool double kick thing I did McGee 4420 um, yes, we are trying to get funky with the kicks, my dude. Gotta keep it funky all across the spectrum. Alright, so, all that I'm gonna do is, uh, target the area that gets louder. When the acid situation starts. So starting right here, setting a very long release. that really high stuff actually play out. So that's uh, that's gonna be my mix pretty much. I think the last thing I might do just to control that last section would be to give a. There's a little bit of craziness that goes on the low end, like the low uh, low mid resonance. So what I could do is actually put on something similar to a multiband compressor, but it. Uh, Acid fry my cerebellum. I like you, McGee 440 or 4420. It also fries my cerebellum. Um, all right, so there's just this part over here when it swoops down. a uh, what we call a dynamic EQ which basically allows me to um, compress but with an EQ curve to target frequency area so it's very smooth so cool so I'm gonna show you the last 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 trick in the book today at least for mixing house music 
It's very, very simple. So every single time that a drop happens, right, we want to feel like the track is punching into us. Now, because of, you know, the bass being there and other things that are happening, it may be that even though the kick is powerful enough on its own, sometimes it feels as though the kick is not powerful enough um, right on the drop. So there's this trick that someone taught me many years ago. It was a legendary mix engineer named Dave Darlington. You can look him up. He's a dude that, uh, he's like one of the spokespeople for Waves, where you just boost the first kick drum every time the kick drum comes out. All right, so, and wherever there's a drop. So literally all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn up the volume on the first kick drum. Every single spot I see that the kick drum falls out and then comes back in. So right here. And what this does is, is it actually draws our attention to the kick drum just for a moment so that it reminds us, hey, this is here. And it actually makes us hear it as being louder after the drop as well. Really, really cool trick. One of the ways that you can kind of manipulate people's perception, which is a big part of what mixing actually is about. All right, and then of course in the first drop, we gotta make sure it happens. Now, I did choose an arbitrary value. Normally I would listen closely, but you know, we don't have that much time. Uh, and I've done this a lot, if I'm being completely honest. So I'm guessing that a buck and a half should get us where we need to go. All right, and it looks like I also didn't reduce the bass line later in the track before we, or did I? Okay. All right, so let's listen to what that does now. So we're just gonna look through at this spot and hear how it helps it. Right, so the kick just punches. Right, so now that kick is really there when it comes back in. We'll check it right here too. Now, a couple of things that are important to point out before we wrap up here is that I didn't do anything to these bongos. Like, that's okay. You don't have to do something to everything. If it sounds good, don't touch it. Maybe like literally the one tiniest thing I could do would just put the sausage fattener on there. It's even just a matter of taste. I don't even necessarily think it makes it sound better. And maybe just send it to that reverb. Now the important thing is that when you use a return track, You need to make sure that you cut out any low frequencies that are going to interfere with the track, unless you specifically are using the return to create like a techno style kick or something, in which case you definitely don't want to cut out the lows on the reverb because that's what it's supposed to be doing. So I'm just going to cut it off so that none of the bass frequencies muddy up the mix. That's it. So I want to put a crash right there.
All right, that sounded pretty tight. Uh, I'm satisfied with that. So the last thing that I would do, I will chew off my hand to take your courses these next years. Please don't chew off your hand. I would love for you to keep your hand, but um, <laughs> but you should definitely take some courses, man. <laughs> Um, all right, so the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you uh, a little bit of mixed bus processing. I'm going to be very, very quick about this. Um, so there's this free plugin from Tokyo Dawn Labs, Tokyo Dawn Labs, called the Kotelnikov. It's a compressor. Um, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I don't do any digital mixed bus compression. I have a bunch of expensive analog gear sitting in front of me that I pass everything through. But that doesn't mean you can't get really good results with this stuff. So what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to take the attack and make it slow. And I'm going to take, this gives me a really cool thing. I have a release time for my peaks and a release time for my RMS, right? So my peaks, I want to control a little bit more. So maybe I have a longer release time. My RMS though, I want that to be poppy and funky, All right? So I'm going to have that be fast. And these are just vague settings. Like I'm going to have to adjust them probably a little bit. Uh, and then, yeah, my threshold is at zero. My ratio is at two. That's fine. Um, this has a cool thing called the low end relax. Uh, I don't want that really to happen too much. I like how the low end is working. So maybe I'll set that to 80. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the largest, loudest part of my track, which actually is probably right here. And this is actually working because you can see it pushing down more when the when the acid thing is getting too loud. So all I'm really looking to do is get like one decibel of gain reduction. I'm not even joking. So it just gives it a nice tightness and color. <laughs> the last thing I'm gonna do. Sorry, sorry. I'll stop saying it. I'm just. I get really into this stuff. <laughs> That sounds great. And then maybe just to warm the entire thing up, I wouldn't typically do this because since, but since I made the whole thing in the box, literally, this is the closest I can come to being able to use my tube EQ. So I'm gonna drag on the pull tech and this, I, I potentially am not even gonna have to touch this, I'm gonna be honest. That sounds great. Just fills out the low end immediately. It's so crazy. I'm just going to do a little dip at 500, a little boost at 300, 2000, a wide band boost at 8. The new uh, generation's music would be um, a synthesis of those two elements and some third thing that might rely uh, heavily on uh, uh, electronics, uh, tapes. I can kind of envision maybe a one person with a, uh, a lot of machines, tapes, electronic sounds, uh, uh, singing or speaking and using machines. I'm just going to attenuate the low end a little. Brings it to life. Hell yeah, Becky Lock. Both sound massive. All right, and then the <laughs> the last thing I'm gonna do in this chain, not the last thing I'm gonna do all day. So now you got me on my semantics. Is I'm gonna use the isotope imager. Um, and this is the last thing that you do in this chain. Actually, you know what? That might be a lie. Might use some tape after this. I'm sorry. I'm just lying all left and right. So. I'm going to just create four bands, uh, and what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to 
do some interesting little, maybe some counterintuitive things you might think about. I'm going to tighten the low end. So first I'm going to solo the low end and hear what is going on. So that information I'm going to solo. So what I can do with this is I can, or not solo, I'm sorry, I'm going to mono. Mono it out. So that allows me to tighten up the bottom. And it's really high stuff. I'm going to spread a little bit. Like that. And then the high mids. That sounds great. And then just to polish it off. Thank you for the usage. Thank you, Roller 8. It's very useful. Yeah, I mean, if you have an actual pair of Poltex, um, or stack a pair of Poltex. Huh. Yeah, it can give it a lot more meat. Um, I use, a, I use a, a fairly expensive tube, boutique tube EQ called the... Uh, Michelangelo from Hendy Amps. It's custom built in Texas by this one dude. It's absolutely incredible. Um, and so I don't really need to use the Poltex stuff, but uh, if you don't have access to that, then yeah, the Poltex are basically, in my opinion, the closest you can get. So I'll just grab, drag on this virtual tape machine from uh, Slate, which usually does really nice stuff. Might not be the right move, but I'm gonna test it out uh, on here. And we're gonna see if it works because now my computer is beach balling. Oh wow. Super exciting. Okay, here we go. So literally just by turning it on, it should make the whole track fatter. But it can get a little crunchy. Yep. Transparent uh, electronics. Thank you, Boulder. Tapes. I can kind of envision maybe a one person with a, uh, a lot of machines, tapes, electronic setups. Uh, so that's without this stupid limiter on. Let's see what this sounds like. Yeah, that sounds like a mix. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'll discuss this with the parties, the powers that be, but maybe we could like give this project out or something. I'm not attached to it emotionally in any way. Um, all right, cool. So that is going to wrap up today's lesson. I hope that that was enjoyable and helpful for you guys. I certainly had a good time. Um, now it is time for me to announce today's winner. Uh, thanks for sticking around as well. I know we're supposed to end at 2 o'clock, but I, or 2.15, but I just got the bug, and I was really into it, and I wanted to give you guys as much information as possible. Uh, so the winner today for the Arturia OBXA plugin is Paul Vanderwerf. Sick name as well. Again, Paul Vanderwerf, you are the winner for today, the Arturia OBXA plugin. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. For the past few weeks, I've recognized a bunch of your names in there um, that have been recurring, you know, throughout these weeks. I've noticed uh, TW Industries, I know Chroma Beats, Nefertiti, of course, you're my girl. Um, and yeah, there are a lot of people, a few other people I'm probably forgetting to mention that I'm remembering. 
But um, I would highly encourage you guys, you know, to subscribe to our channel if you like the content. Um, there's so many amazing videos from all of our different instructors who all are so, so knowledgeable. Um, of course, if you have tuned in late and this is the first time tuning in, this was 343 Labs TV. And we will be continuing to uh, broadcast and just stay tuned because we will, you know, shortly let you guys know what the new schedule is going to look like. But assume that you'll be seeing more of me. Um, and I'm really excited to be working uh, on this stuff and interfacing with you guys. This is like a really great time. Um, I really have a great time doing this and, you know, fielding your guys' questions. Um, it's, it also helps me as a teacher, you know, to uh, kind of see like what stuff I'm maybe not explaining well enough or in enough detail. And uh, you asked some great questions today. So again, this is 343 Labs TV. My name is Lewis Beck. 343 Labs is a music production school based in New York City, and we have strong presence online, as you can, of course, see. We're continuing to build that presence. So please subscribe. And, uh, you know, as the country is opening back up right now, please make sure you stay safe and healthy and just use music to stay happy. So with that being said, peace. Freedom.